Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's session of Fire Safety Essentials for the Population of Grasmere and Surrounds. My name is Raj Samurai, and my co-host is Julie Owens, and together we'll be taking you on this journey through Fire Safety Essentials. As is traditional, we'd like to acknowledge the Gundij Mara people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we're hosting this online meeting this afternoon, and also pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and any other Aboriginal people that are here attending this meeting today. I'd like to hand over to Julie to explain the technology that we're dealing with this afternoon. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Raj, and good afternoon. Yes, we're on a webinar this afternoon, and that means that um, you cannot turn your video or your audio on. You'll be able to interact by answering polls when I put them up on the screen and the chat function. Um, this is being recorded. Raj has pressed the record button, but that it is for our benefit. You will not be recorded. It, will, it is just um, Raj and I um, for the benefit of developing our skills. And there will We are showing some inter, um, animations and short videos and some photos. Um, hope, hopefully it won't be death by PowerPoint because you will be able to interact at a time. There is a chat function which um, we advise you to use. If you hover your mouse over the chat function, um, the box for the chat function will appear and you can just type things. I will be monitoring that. And if there's any questions, just ask. The same, the polls, when I put the polls up, they will be either um, yes or no or multiple choice. You just give your answers, but make sure that you press the submit button in the poll section at the end so that you can um, submit your, your answers. Um, if, um, if you would like to practice your um, chat section session now, just hover your mouse over the chat, um, the box will come up and you can just let us know where you're from. We usually find that this part of the presentation is quite important because we do rely on feedback and engagement from yourselves with the comments that you'd like to raise about any community issues around fire and fire behaviour and fire preparation. So feel free to use the chat function. As Julie said, we can't see you. We can only heed the comments that you give via chat. So please feel free to give your comments. Um, the, other, the other function we've got is the polls function. And I'm, I'm actually going to put a poll up now. Um, you will see when, when I launch that poll, it's just asking you simple questions like how long you've lived in the area, um, have you been to a CFA meeting before, and how you found out about this session, and rating your knowledge around fire. So I'm going to launch this poll now. Hopefully you could see that. So if you could just click on... Um, how long you've lived in the area, um, whether you've been to a CFA meeting before, how did you find out about this session, and then rate your knowledge around fire. That will just give us some idea of um, what you know about fire and the area in which you live. Don't forget that once you've done that, you um, press submit. Um, and if anyone's having any trouble with that, you can just use the chat function to let me know. All right, otherwise, um, that's, we've given you, well, I'll just end that polling now. And um, I can share the results as you will see that nobody's actually used that function. But I'd share the results in this case, you would see um, who else is, not individually, but who else is actually online. So I'll stop sharing the results and back to you, Raj. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for that. So look, it's absolutely crucial that we understand the learning objectives of this afternoon's presentation. Um, it's important that we understand that this is not going to be death by PowerPoint. That's, that's something that Julie's already reiterated. But what we're trying to do here today is to give you some baseline information relating to your local fire risk. 
the presentation is very much localized to your area. We talk about the expectations around fire. We talk also about, you know, when do you know when there is a fire? What are the communication channels that are out there that we need to know? We talk a bit about planning and decision making. And this is crucially important. You know, if you think about the old sort of Cub Scout motto about being prepared, it's something that I've grown up with. And that's the common thread that runs all the way through this presentation, the element of preparedness. The CFA are passionate about delivering this message in, the, in a manner that is easy to digest. Of course, you know, surviving if the plan fails or you get caught out, that's always going to be a Cub Scout rule, isn't it? You know, if plan A doesn't work, you've got plan B, C and D. Let's spend a bit of time talking about local fire risks. Now, this particular presentation is targeted towards the communities in Grasmere and the surrounds. And I see that we've got Bill on board from Injimara. Welcome, Bill. Grasmere is located in the municipality of Moyne. It's very much a rural residential area, about 10 kilometres north of Warrnambool and located west of a loop in the Merai River. It was named after Grasmere in the Lake District in the UK by Thomas Manifold back in 1852. So I've got local knowledge for you there. The immediate population of Grasmere is 402. One thing that Julie and I have found um, delivering these presentations in a face-to-face -face capacity is the tremendous amount of community cohesion that sits in our communities this need to look out for each other. And this is something that the CFA also endorses and is very passionate about. Many of our firefighters, including your CFA captain, um, John, um, are very passionate about the community support that we get at the time of crises. The, the element of looking after your neighbours, looking after those vulnerable members of your community. Up first, we're going to take you through the elements of the Victorian landscape. And as you can see from this slide, the landscape across Victoria and across Australia varies considerably. We can have areas of grassland, bushland, and of course, mountainous forest area. And of course, not to, make, not to forget farmland, which is quite extensive. As the slide clearly shows, Victoria is one of the most bushland parts, bush prone parts of the world. We often have comparisons with California and, uh, in the US, but believe it or not, we are sitting in an area of a high risk. Fire has been present in the Australian continent for millions of years and has been significant in shaping much of the landscape. Many fires in the early days and even to present time can be started by lightning. When we consider the activities of Aboriginal people, they used fire for many thousands of years to care for country. The fires were a tool that encouraged the growth and extent of grasslands to also enhance hunting, reduce the levels of fuel and keep, it, and keep the vegetation from becoming too dense so they allowed a passage to walk through. We'll talk more about roadside fuel burns and fuel load very shortly. They are important considerations, no doubt. This is a snapshot of our area, the southwest of Victoria. This is actually a map that denotes the different weather districts in our state. Each fire district is, has its own level of fire risk. Another thing we may need, we need to definitely take into consideration is a seasonal outlook. So what do I mean by seasonal outlook? This describes the overall weather trend of what is happening in your weather district. Many of you will have heard of the La Nina effect. This is in force as we speak now. La Nina conditions are expected to reduce, and I say reduce the risk of prolonged fire, fire activity across most of Victoria compared to last year. So let, let's get a bit more technical, not too technical, but look, what, what does La Nina actually mean? La Nina means that we'll have increased rainfall much across much of Australia. And, and this has been evidenced in Victoria, I'm sure you'll all agree, more wetter than normal. 
La Nina also means cooler daytime temperatures. You wouldn't think that today, I know, but yes, generally speaking, cooler daytime temperatures, particularly south of the tropics, warmer overnight temperatures in the north. For your information, the last La Nina appeared during the winter of 2017, 2018, and this was followed by its, its partner, El Nino, in 2018-19. So that is this cyclical pattern in this weather, weather phenomena. Grasmere is in a part of Victoria that has experienced slightly above average rainfall and has above average soil moisture. Now, what that means is there's enough moisture to make the grass grow well. But remember that it will dry off very quickly. And as soon as you, particularly when we experience warm weather as we're having today, rapid growing, rapid drying or curing, as we like to say. Note that nearby bush will also dry out very quickly. And there's an, an increased potential for fast moving grass fires. More, more about that very shortly. The, the main statement that we would like to make here is to say that like every season, there is a need to be prepared for a fire that could happen due to this high fuel load. And here's a, a diagrammatic of some of those things that we mentioned earlier in terms of the seasonal outlook. Clearly more rain across much of Australia. What about local vegetation? When we talk about local vegetation, we're, we're saying that there's an increased amount of, of grass. Now, I might just throw it open to chat here. And for those of you who are familiar with using the chat function, as uh, Julie's explained, the chat question is, what type of landscape do you think we have in your area? What sort of landscape is it? So on the chat function, if anyone could answer that. And also, we'll explore that a bit further as to, well, why does it matter? What, why does it matter that the predominant landscape is such? Is there anything coming through there, Julie? Um, no, not at, not at present. We haven't got people. That's Lots so of great. grassland in this area. Absolutely. Well, certainly the predominant fuel in Grasmere uh, is grass with areas of bush and mainly bush alongside roadsides. So this is an area clearly of high risk from fast moving grass fires with likely ember attack from nearby bush to the north, northwest and the west. So this is, this is quite evident from, from past experiences also. You may have had a chat come in there. Yes, I think, uh, yeah, that's your own, isn't it? Uh, yeah, lots of grasslands. Yeah, course, lots of no grasslands. Problem. What I might do here, Raj, is actually um, launch the poll. We have a poll yeah. that asks about those like local risks, what people think those local uh, yes. risks might be. Yep. So um, just understanding your local, local risk. This is a multiple choice, so there's no right or wrong answer. And remember, when you do the polls, we can't tell who's ticking what. Um, we can just see the answers. So if I launch this poll and if we can um, have people actually ticking what they think might be the local risks in this area. Um, and you will see that uh, winding roads, trees hanging over all access roads or escape routes, high tourists in summer, perhaps that doesn't relate necessarily to Grasmere, um, but it would relate to the roads going through Grasmere, the speed of grass fires, numerous grass fires sparked by embers and a high, high fuel load. We'll just end the polling there and I would share the results though nobody in this case has actually done any so I'll just stop sharing that and back to you Raj. Yeah look I think I'd like to expand a bit more on that Julie just to let our audience know that okay open grassland as is typified in the Grasmere area is susceptible to the wind. The wind is the driving force. The, the direction of the wind will impact on the direction of the fire. The direction of the wind will also determine, I guess, the, the drying rate of the grass. Once it's cured, the, the wind will assist in the drying process. And one thing to remember here is that Fires can even come from the southwest, depending on that wind, okay? Not, it's not always that hot northerly that is typifying of, of fast-moving grass fires. 
We've also mentioned trees on road reserves and bush reserves. They will often generate embers. And we'll spend a bit of time talking about embers very shortly. Now, these embers spread the fire and create numerous small fires ahead of the fire front. When we talk about topography and hills and the undulations, that's so typical of Grasmere, we've got to understand that fires move faster uphill than they do downhill. And as a rule of thumb in the CFA and as a community perspective, we say that for every 10 degree increase in slope, a fire will effectively double in speed, okay? And the reason behind this is this is due to the greater amount of radiant heat and also greater convective heat. What does this mean overall? Overall, this means that if a fire started in the Grasmere area, has has done in the past and not that long ago, there is a lot of fuel that will burn and this will grow and move very quickly. <clears throat> I might just spend a couple of seconds um, answering also a few comments that were made around the local risks. And it's quite important that following the poll that we've just had, that we get a real understanding of what those local risks are, particularly in Grasmere. You know, we have one of the critical emergencies that happens in the Grasmere area is the flooding at the bridge. And often traffic is diverted, traffic is diverted across through Woodford and back round to avoid that bridge or point of weakness. That's an area of weakness when it comes to flooding, but also when it comes to fire. There's a huge gradient there that our fire trucks have to navigate and get through. It's windy, it's undulating, and some of the hills have a false crest, so you never know what's on the other side. So if you compound that with poor visibility during times of fire, it's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? We've spoken about the speed of grass fires, they're highly accelerated, in fact, double for every 10 degrees uh, rise in inclination. Grass fires that travel fast are a force of nature. They are hard to control, they are hard to predict. And as we've already spoken, fire direction is governed by wind direction. The moment a wind change comes through, the direction of the fire changes. So what, what does this mean in your area? You've got an amazing brigade that's headed, headed up by John, as your CFA captain. You've got 34 active members in the Grassmere Brigade. They have at their disposal one tanker and one quick fill, okay? If we do the maths around the population of 402 living in approximately 148 properties and dwellings, the rhetorical question that we put to our audience on at this point is, well, how confident can you be that you'll see a tanker on your drive in the event of a bad fire day? I might just leave that hanging there for a second because this is also very resource dependent. The brigade do an amazing job, but even the brigade is stretched when we have a bad fire day. Often brigades are pulled in all directions to attend to other fires as well. Up until this point, what the message is that we've been trying to articulate is to say that you've got to have a basic understanding of fire behavior and appreciation of this uncontrollable force of nature. There is a need to be aware of the various risks that exist in your area, and we've alluded to those. There has to be that awareness of your personal responsibility and your personal safety. Both Julie and I are passionate about community safety and risk mitigation. If we know that there's going to be a bad fire day, why is it that we stay in harm's way? Why don't we think about the risk? and move ourselves away from that risk. I might just move on to talk to you about what to expect from a fire. We know that Victoria had its fair share of fire, fires last year in multiple parts of this state. We're gonna really try and get underneath the skin of fire. I'm about to show you an, anim an animation that some of you might find distressing, so please look away if that is the case. It is designed to shock and it's designed to bring home that message 
that, okay, fires are dangerous. During a bushfire, embers will reach your home long before the flames do. Ember attacks are the most common way that houses catch fire. Embers are burning leaves, twigs and pieces of bark. They help the bushfire spread by starting spot fires ahead of the main fire front. Short distance ember attacks happen when leaves and small pieces of bark are blown from burning trees. The intense shower of sparks that forms fills the air with hot burning embers which will land on nearby vegetation and properties. The hot embers can easily land and get into your clothes and burn your skin, eyes and airways. Small fires will start all around you and quickly become uncontrollable. The resulting chaos creates confusion as the fire seems to come from many directions, meaning it will be difficult to make good decisions about your safety. The experience will be physically exhausting and emotionally traumatic. Long distance ember attack is caused by large bushfires that generate intense heat. As the hot air rises, it forms a column of smoke that sucks in air like a vacuum, increasing the intensity of the fire. The updraft in the column lifts embers, like large pieces of burning ribbon bark, hundreds of metres into the air, where strong winds can carry them many kilometres beyond the fire front. On Black Saturday, embers travelled more than 30 kilometres ahead of the main fire. When these embers land, they often start fires where leaves naturally accumulate, like in gutters, doorways and garden beds. So while you might think you're safe when a bushfire is far away, embers can fall from the sky and land around your home long before you even know there's a fire. But remember, your home isn't the only thing under threat during an ember attack. By the time you realise the danger, it might be too late as escape routes become jammed. Embers can also start fires on roads and block them completely, making late evacuation dangerous or impossible. That's why leaving early, before a fire starts, is always your safest option. Graphic, I know. Julie, would you like to pass some comment over the nature of ember attack? Um, as you saw, ember, ember attack is part of a fire that can happen. And as they said on Black Saturday, over 30 kilometres. Um, at one of the recent fires in the Fram Forest, we had 20 kilometres um, embers were travelling. So in the wind, the ember attack is the most um, dangerous and the cause of many properties being destroyed in fire. Thanks, Julie. Um, and look, we, we spend a lot of time doing research into this space. You know, Ember Attack is a big player, but we've also got direct flame impact as well. And what we mean by direct flame impact is when dry fuel on your property allows a running grass fire to burn right up to your house. Direct flame impact, as you can see with that visual on the right hand side with the fire there. This is because there's continuity of fuel between the fire and your home. If you have the capacity to create a break of some kind, and by break we mean an area or a cleared area where there's no continuity of fuel, it might be a drive, it might be a, a, a glass, a, a, a gravel, a graveled area perhaps, that will actually limit the continuity and the progression of the fire. We often say that vegetation looks to burn. And by that, we mean that it's ready for burn and for the germination of seeds. And that's something that our um, previous um, uh, uh, inhabitants of so the indigenous people were very keen to do for the preservation of the land. 
And the old adage that if you've got fuel to your doorstep, you will have fire to your doorstep. And once again, I'm now going to show you another video animation while, while Julie um, is able to make You're some comment over the other elements. So you will see with this video, if ember attack is the greatest risk to property during a fire, then radiant heat is the greatest risk to people, um, to living things. And this is a, a very graphic video that shows what happens mm -hmm. to living things during um, radiant heat. Thank you, Julie. Look away if you find that this is going to be distressing for you. Radiant heat. <laughs> Victoria is one of the most bushfire-prone parts of the world. Every summer, bushfires threaten properties and lives. But did you know it's not the flames that kill most bushfire victims? No, it's the radiant heat. Most victims die from the effects of radiant heat long before they're reached by the flames. Radiant heat is what you feel when you sit next to a campfire. If a campfire heats up, to two kilowatts per square metre, you'll feel that it's too hot and will want to move back from the fire. If you don't, this amount of radiant heat is enough to cause burns and blisters in as little as 40 seconds. At 12 kilowatts, it can cause some materials like dry timber to ignite. A bushfire can reach 100 kilowatts and the effects can be truly catastrophic. For humans, radiant heat can cause burns from 100 metres away and cause a dangerous increase in body temperature. Radiant heat can cause the rapid onset of heat stroke. Heat stroke damages your brain, meaning you won't be able to concentrate to make good decisions as the fire arrives. Other impacts include severe damage of internal organs and death. There are some things you can do if you're caught in a fire. Cover your skin with long-sleeved natural fibre clothing, like wool. It's also useful to know that radiant heat only travels in straight lines and can't bend around corners. So, sheltering behind or inside solid structures may help protect you. But be aware, radiant heat will travel straight through glass. The best defence against radiant heat is a simple one. If you're not anywhere near a bushfire, its radiant heat can't hurt you. Leaving early is always your safest option. So, yes, another very graphic depiction of the nature of fire. Radiant heat is the forebearer. It's invisible. It can't be seen. It certainly can be felt. If I take myself back to my camping days and sitting around a campfire, it's quite clear that even being close to a campfire from a metre or two away, and once the heat gets unbearable, you have to move away. Can you imagine that? 100 kilowatts as opposed to two kilowatts. This is the, the, the penetrating, harmful nature that is radiant heat. Why be in harm's way? Why be in the way of the biggest killer in a fire? Why be in the way when we can reduce our risk by not being there? This is a, a testimonial of some of the comments that were made by people who caught themselves, who were caught out in fire situations. The CFA often conduct interviews with people that have survived fires and statements like this bring it all home, particularly when they come from people who felt that they had a fairly good chance of survival. I'd like to play a, another animation with you now. Uh, highlighting some of those concerns. The actual animation is entitled, I'll Never Do That Again. And what it does is gives, gives us an understanding straight 
from the person exactly what it was that made them stay away at that time. So, Julie, if you just bear with me one second, I'll just find that animation. So th this video is of actual people sharing their stories when they were um, caught in a bushfire or a grass fire. So you will see that um, this, the, most of them, the majority of people say they would never do it again if they had the choice. And these are real stories from real people. Um, obviously they survived um, when they were involved in these fires. Right, it appears that our technology uh, not going to work. It may. Oh, yes, here we go. Right. Okay, here we go. This is I'll Never Do That Again. Ten years ago, when every, all the dams were full and the tanks were full and there was plenty of water, I probably would have stayed and I would have died. Nothing went the way we might have anticipated. Whatever preparations you put into place, you only need something small to go wrong. You know, in, in future, I, I don't think we'd want to put the kids through that sort of trauma, I guess. Yeah, wouldn't put the kids through that again. If it was my choice, I wouldn't stay again. If, another, if we had another day like that, uh, if I had the opportunity to get out, I would go before the fire even got here. Go before the fire even got here. You know, that's the closing statement from one of our interviewees. I think graphics and words speak volumes at times like this. It makes the job for Julie and myself a lot easier because the writing is on the wall. You've got evidence to say, don't be in harm's way. Be out of the fire area, be gone. Have your plan, leave early. And after doing a number of these presentations across, um, across our state, it's quite clear that a lot of people will agree that you can always come back to your home. If the fire changes direction, your home is safe, you can come back to your home. And we all have insurance. You know, we have this level of protection. But one of the things we must always be mindful of is that preservation of life. That's irreplaceable. So at this stage, Raj, I just might um, launch another poll that asks what you would expect from fire. So it was, uh, it's interesting to see those comments on the, on the page. Most of them were from 2009, but there was one from 2018 from Cobden, the Cobden fires, which were predominantly grass fires. And they, their comments were similar to the ones who suffered in the 2009 bushfires. So fire is fire. But what do you expect from fire? If you are caught in a fire, I'm going to launch this poll. If you could just tick, this is a multiple choice, so there's no wrong or right answer and there's no just one answer. What do you think would impact your ability to make good decisions um, in a fire? What do you think would impact your ability to make good decisions? And actually, these, these questions could be asked in any situation, not just in a fire. So if you could just tick each of those, um, which would impact that ability. Um, I'm not sure. I will I'll end the polling. Um, oh, no, thank you. Um, Bill, you've obviously ticked stress and communication breakdown. So those things would impact your ability to make good decisions. And stress is a, I'll just end the poll here and I'll share the results. Um, I know that in my situation, if things didn't go to plan, that's usually when I freak out, when something isn't going the way it's meant to go. Um, and even in a situation like this when you know the video doesn't show play when you're doing a presentation that's um that's quite stressful for me and that can sometimes hinder my ability to make a good decision so i'll just stop sharing so thank you and i'll just stop sharing those results
Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Bill, for your for your feedback there. You know, the, the when we talk about us as human beings, it's very hard for us to be able to say how we would respond in an emergency or critical in incidents. The majority of us would be in a very high stress load, a very uncomfortable position, very traumatic situation, certainly. Some of us might have some level of calmness and be able to see the wood from the trees, if you like. But on the whole, the, the cognitive function will be severely impaired. Our ability to think straight, our ability to plan and be methodical in our approach is going to be severely impacted. Many of the fires that have happened where we've had extensive fatalities have all been as a result of this lack of preparation, the lack, lack of foresight around understanding embers, understanding red in teeth, the very basics of fire behaviour. And as I've said time and time again, it's the very nature of fire, underestimating this, this force of nature that causes us to become complacent. And complacency leads to errors, which leads to fatalities. When we talk about fires, one of the other critical components is, well, how do we know if there is a fire? I might just open up the chat function on this one, Julie, to see if our listeners know, how do they know if there's a fire? Where did, where's their information come from? What's the local intel? Um, if anyone has any ideas um, as to where they get that information from, just um, put it in the chat and we'll monitor that. Fantastic. And while we're looking for that feedback, it might be a great idea at this point to explain, explain this symbol, the fire danger rating or FDR, often found um, on the television, often seen in social media and also uh, on, as a sign on the road, generally near fire stations or uh, CFA sheds. Julie, what, what does the FDR actually mean? Well, what do we understand from it? Before, um, before we answer that question, before I talk on that, I'm just going to put up another poll. Um, this poll is going to ask you what you think the fire danger rating means, the FDR. Um, is it an indication of how likely a fire will start or is it an indication of how bad that fire will be? And how many code red days that's right um, that we've had in the southwest in the last five years and how many severe or extreme days? If, um, if you would like to just have a go and don't forget at the end of it, once you've done it, you've got to press the submit button for the polling to work. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to answer that. Thank you. I'll end the polling there and share your results. And you're spot on. The, um, the fire danger rating actually says is an indication of how bad a fire will be if one were to start not how likely it is to start. Um, code red days in the Southwest, we've had none. There's been no code red days in the Southwest since they were introduced in 2009, but we have had quite a few severe to extreme. We've had six days of those. Um, that, might, that might surprise some people that in the Southwest, we haven't had a code red day, but a code red day is catastrophic. So I might just go um, briefly about what each of those mean, even though um, it appears that, um, that Bill knows, knows exactly what they mean. But on a severe day, so a fire will start on any of those, any of those ratings. So it's um, low, moderate, high, very high, a fire will start. But it just depends how easily it will be to put out. So on a severe day, um, it will it's hot, dry, and possibly wind, windy conditions. If a fire starts, it takes hold. It may be uncontrollable. 
but on an extreme day, it will be uncontrollable. You will have the hot, windy and dry conditions again. There will be spot fires that will move quickly and it might come from many directions. And of course, on a code red day, um, they're the worst conditions possible. Hot, dry, windy, it doesn't matter if it's bush or grass, homes are not designed or constructed to withstand fires in these conditions and the safest places to be away from bushfire areas on a code red day. So you will see that each of those are actually linked to how easily a fire would be managed, would be um, controlled, and that's, that's what the fire danger rating is. So on a high-risk day, CFA is pushing for people to leave the area before that before a fire starts. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julie. And, and, and the other take home message, just to reinforce um, Julie's explanation is that we can use severe extreme encoded as our triggers. You know, if we know it's gonna be a severe day, don't wait for extreme or code, code red. Leave, leave the night before, or early the next morning, before the temperatures get up, before the conditions become uncontrollable, as Julie has mentioned. Don't wait to see. Don't wait to see if it's going to potentiate into an extreme or a code red. And the idea of avoiding forested areas, um, thick bush uh, and long dry grass. Know your trigger when you are going to be leaving. Where are you going to leave to? When will you be leaving? And when will you be returning? What's it going to look like when you return? Are you going to be able to return? All these questions are part of your fire plan. Now, there's no need for you to take notes during this presentation. Um, it's a, we will be supplying you with some links that you can um, select information that you want to further explore. And one of them really is the leaving early template, which allows you to have a systematic approach and understanding of what leaving early means and how to implement that in the event of a bad fire day. Now, what I'd like to talk about next is when we talk about communication, we, we live in a world where we are bombarded from all directions with information, whether it's the traditional watching the television, listening to the radio or buying the local newspaper. We now have a, almost an infobesity explosion where we have digital platforms that give us far more information, far more readily, and often in a certain uh, opinionated mode, okay? At the CFA, what we like to do is consider the slide that you see in front of you at the moment as what we call informal sources of information. You know, that casual conversation in the cafe, that casual conversation when you're walking the dog perhaps, or you might overhear a neighbor talking about something. Certainly information, but is it credible? What we like to insist is that all community members, particularly in fire prone areas, have one of these or as many of these as their possible avenues to seek information. This is a real time information. It's evidence based and it's clear and concise. It can be obtained and we would like to think that all our community members have the Vic Emergency app on their mobile phones as their number one go to to assess fire behavior on a bad fire day. The Vic Emergency app is unique in many ways. It allows you to view, uh, set a radius on the app so that you can actually view fire activity in your immediate area or, for, or further afield. If in the case that you're traveling, we're able to establish a, a, a clear route away from fire, avoiding any fire hotspots. So this is invaluable. Local news, the local ABC news is one of the best ways of keeping in touch with what's going on in your locality on a bad fire day. We at the CFA would suggest that you have a battery operated radio as part of your emergency kit that allows you to connect with the outside world on the event of a bad fire day. We're now going to spend just a a few minutes giving you um, 
a, a sense of the triage that's used through the Vic Emergency app as our recognised warning system when it comes to a pending fire situation. So if we look at um, if we look at these um, each of these warnings, I'm we first do, we're going to say is do not wait for a warning. But if you received an advice warning, and you'll get these um, on your phone, on the um, website, on the Vic Emergency app, the advice is just telling you that there is an incident in your area. There is something has occurred and you need to access information. You need to find out. It's just a notification to say that there is um, some sort of incident and you need to find out what's going on. At present, there's no real danger to you. A watch and act tells you that the emergency is developing. You do need to take action and that it is possible there is a danger to you. And of course, the emergency warning tells you that you are in imminent danger and you need to take action immediately. You will be impacted. Um, the other two are the evacuation. If you are asked to evacuate, that's what you should do. And part of your plan should be where you will evacuate to if you, you need to. That will give you some idea of the procedures for evacuation. And the community information is usually a newsletter that is actually published after the incident. So that will tell you um, and communities that are affected by the incident or by the emergency where they can get help, um, where they can go, what sort of things are available to them. But we stress, the CFA stresses that you do not wait for a warning. Those warnings are available and they're there. And you are to monitor, monitor them, but you don't wait for a warning um, if you feel that there is something not right. And Raj will explain that a bit later, but I might just um, show you this short animation to highlight why you don't wait for a warning. So we've given an example of a fire starts. So a fire starts, you're in your home, you're sitting in watching TV, um, you might have the curtains drawn, um, everything's fine, electricity, electricity is on, um, but you, it's hot and windy, but you're not monitoring, you're sitting there. Fire starts, so triple zero, if someone rings triple zero, that's when the firefighters are, um, are, in, uh, are told that there's a fire. So that doesn't happen until five minutes after the, at least five minutes after the fire starts. It's not till 10 minutes that the firefighters are in their trucks and heading to the fire. And as you can see, the fire has now grown. So if it's 10 minutes and the firefighters have headed to the fire, there's no advice warning yet. Nobody's been, triple zero has started the process, but the advice warning isn't sent out until say 15 minutes after the fire starts. And if you look at this little house that's sitting right in front of the fire, so the advice message is only received a few minutes before the fire is, to, is impacting your house. 20 minutes, you get the emergency warning. And it's too late. The fire's gone past. If you lived along this line past the 30 minutes, you all have got the emergency warning when the fire is away from you and you would have been able to do something. So you might be ahead of the warning depending where the fire starts. So that just illustrates our advice that you do not wait for the warnings. You have to depend on yourself to, um, to know what's going on in your area. And Raj will explain a little bit more about how, do, how you do that. Thank you, Julie. Uh, uh, this is a lovely segue from what we've just spoken about to where we are now. Here, here we are, you're sitting in your house, and this fire has engulfed you without you even realising. You may have had the curtains closed. You may, you may be watching Netflix movie. You, you've not noticed what's going on around you. The key to survival is about being, um, I suppose, mindful of your environment, using that intuitive sense that all of us have that would often say, well, this doesn't sound right or this doesn't look right, and then acting on that, that initiative, that impulse that you might have using your senses to see, to hear, and to smell, 
to see smoke, to see embers descending or flying, to hear the noise of fire, because fire is a, a noisy creature. And obviously smelling smoke. Smelling the smoke is a clear indicator, often want, wafted along by our winds. The moment you get a sense that things aren't right, that's the time to take action. As Julie said, we have an elaborate warning system, but it's not as effective as we would like because sometimes the advice message is received too late, not giving us enough time potentially to make and activate our fire escape plan. So remember those. And what we're trying to do is say, well, up until this point in the presentation, we've identified the fire danger rating and its significance, what it means. Use that as your guide. Remember also the WIC Emergency App and its usefulness in this scenario. Don't wait for that warning. Use your intu intuition and make those informed decisions to leave. You can always come back. Leave with your emergency bag. Leave whilst you're caring for vulnerable members in the community. And that comes back to that very cohesive nature that I know that we've got in Grassmere and other similar communities. Use your initiative to make that first step and be out of harm's way. When we talk about some of those first steps, it's all about planning and decision making. Why, why risk, risk a fatality? Why, why risk being in harm's way? What Julie and I are now going to do is we're going to bring all the elements that we've spoken about together in a hypothetical situation. It's as close as that we can get to explain to you the importance of being very savvy to fire and very quick in your response. We've spoken about the resources. We've spoken about the nature of fire. We've spoken about radiant heat, ember attack. We've spoken about the need to care for your communities and stay monitor the big emergency app at all times. We've spoken about the need to be away from fire, particularly if you know it's going to be a bad fire day. This scenario that we're going to, Julie is going to present to us, takes all those components and gives you an idea of what it would really look like in a real life situation. Thank you, Julie. So it is a, um, an extreme day. It's a hot and windy day. Um, it's eight o'clock on Wednesday morning and you look outside and you see that, yeah, it is a hot and windy day, just as they predicted. But you needed to come into Warrnambool and what Warrnambool's only 10 kilometres, 15 kilometres at the most from where you live, depending on which road you're going to go. So you think that's fine, that's not very far. So you hop in the car and you shoot into Warrnambool. Perhaps you've got a doctor's appointment or you needed to do some last minute shopping for a birthday party on the weekend. As you're driving into town, you can see that it is windy and there's bits of branches falling off the trees as you go. Um, and, it, and you can feel the heat coming through the gra glass of the windows. Remember that um, radiant heat comes through, travels through glass. So you do what you have to do and it's lunchtime and you're thinking about going home, but you stop at the cafe to have a coffee or a little bit of lunch before you come home. And you hear people talking about a fire that started just out of Warrnambool. And you look just near on the Grassmere side of Warrnambool and you look up into the sky and you can't really see anything. It's very windy and that haze could be coming from anywhere. So you jump on the Evic Emergency app and you have a look and you see that, well, yeah, the fire has started a short way from your place. Um, that zone that you've got, the yellow line, is not quite to your house, but it's there. So you think, okay, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home and make sure that everything is okay. So you hop back in your car straight away and you head home and you find that the road is blocked by police. You wind down your window and they advise you that it's not safe to go into the area. There is a fire burning and trees have come down on the road. Um, you'll have to find somewhere else to go until the road is reopened. And that could be two hours, it could be four hours, it could be overnight. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions about, about that day and how you would actually, where you would have actually been and how you will react to it. And I'm going to do that by launching the poll. So what does this scenario mean to you? 
So I'm going to launch this next poll that asks you some questions about that day. So it's an average Wednesday. I'm going to launch the poll now. It's an average Wednesday in summer. Where would you be? Um, and if you think about last summer, uh, would you be prepared to spend the night? If you got to that roadblock, would you be prepared to spend the night away from home in a situation like that? And then last summer again, did you have an emergency kit packed with some clothes, important documents, photos or medicine? So if you could just tick each of those, remember that there's no right or wrong answer and we can't tell who's actually answering what in our polls. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and I am going to share the results. So yes, you would be home in a situation like this on a typical Wednesday. Um, you would be prepared to spend a few nights away from home in an emergency situation, that's very good, but you wouldn't have those important documents or photos um, packed in an emergency kit. Uh, I'll stop sharing those results. And I might, Raj, if that's all right, if you continue on with the scenario. Absolutely. So if I continue on with the scenario, thank you for those answers. That was really good. And it shows that you are thinking about where you would have been on that Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go back to that same day, except that this time when you jump on the Vic Emergency app, you see that the fire is quite a way away from you. You see, there is a fire towards the Grassmere. You're in Warrnambool and it is towards Grassmere's um, area, but it is away. It's fairly, it's farther away. The yellow, yellow um, shaded area isn't quite, well, is not reaching your home. So you've got enough time to come home. So this time you jump in your car and you drive home. There's no roadblock, you're fine. You get to your house. Um, you get into your driveway, you can smell the smoke and it's really windy, it's hot. You could, see the, you could see the smoke and you could smell it. But you think, you hop on the app again, no, it hasn't moved, the fire's still in the same place. Um, you just, you have a look, you're using those sentences and you think you're, for, you're far enough away. So you move frantically around the house, you're grabbing the important things, like your documents, you're grabbing your um, your your photos, your birth certificate, your insurance papers. You're making sure that your animals are fine. You've checked, you've put the cat in the basket and you're putting it, you're running in and out from the car. You're running in and out from the house, into the car, back to the house. It's taking a lot longer than you think. And then just as you're running out again, you see that little patches of smoke coming up from the garden bed and that those embers we talked about earlier are starting to fall. Can't actually see flames yet, but you can see those embers and they're falling into those bits of grass that you haven't, or leaves that you haven't raked up. How do you feel now? What do you think of how you're going to survive now? Um, what do you do now? And what could you have done differently when you're in this situation? So if you could use the chat function, just type just a few words, what you could have done differently. How do you feel in a situation like this? Where are the kids? Where are the people who depend on you? Um, do you have horses on your property? Uh, what, are, what are the are the trees? What are the trees doing? Are there any close to your property that's going to be a problem? If you did drop everything and manage to hop into the car, Remember that Grassmere has those narrow winding roads. Are you going to be able to get away from that property, your property, easily? So if you want, would like to use the chat function, you just put some um, one word even, how you feel, what you would do, and what could you have done differently in a situation like that? Remember the stress that your body will be under at this stage whether you can make those decisions um, when all of this is happening around you. Do you know, Julie, it's quite interesting, isn't it? You, it, it almost seems like we're bombarding our listeners with lots of questions, lots of scenarios. And this is only a hypothetical. You know, uh, I'm getting quite agitated by all the what's, ifs, buts, et cetera. 
can you imagine what this would be like in a real life situation when there really is a fire of a magnitude uh, it, the mind boggles doesn't it it's sort of uh, it's hard to imagine that we would voluntarily put ourselves in that position that's correct that's correct raj um, and it's and it just it illustrates how those good decisions that you could make in um, calm, peaceful conditions um, are not made in a stressful situation like a fire. Absolutely, yeah. Which, which leads on quite nicely to our next slide, which is a summary of everything that we want our, our listeners to be aware of. And that's that, that the P word, that the preparation, the preparedness, having a plan, you know, thinking ahead and making sure that that plan is is viable and everyone's on the same page with that fire plan listen about having the having the having the big emergency app on your mobile phone and also uh, we are we do offer a service where we can um, offer a bushfire planning workshop in your area as well and we'll certainly give you the link for that at the end of our presentation it's available through our resource pack but the number one thing has to be preparation be prepared know about fire and as Bill has said in the chat, get out with your papers and pets. So if you are prepared and you have those, even if that person, when they race back to their house the second time, got into their house, grabbed the bag with all the important papers, uh, photos at the front door, threw it in the car, grabbed the cat and off they went, the situation would have been much different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as a... Um as we live through these uncertain times of COVID-19, we have to make mention of COVID-19 and how that applies in the event of a leaving early or a, um, a bad fire day. Um, clearly, you may leave a high-risk fire area on the day of a high fire danger, and you may also travel for the purpose of repairing your property for the fire season. That's, that's not an issue. The only proviso that we do suggest is that if anyone is in isolation or self-isolation to make sure that they maintain that isolation to wherever they move to and make sure that people in that accommodation are aware of your self-isolating. The best laid plans can fail as I mentioned at the beginning. You might have the best fire plan. Everyone may well be on the on the page on the same page but certainly as we spoke about in some of the, the videos and animations that we've seen, if people have known that fire was going to be as unpredictable, as harsh, and as menacing as it turned out to be, they would not have stayed. They would have, they would have gone. They would have left and had their fire plan and left early. But what if that plan fails? And as we spoke earlier with the radiation, radiant heat animation, Covering up is the best thing to do. Maximum coverage for every part of your body as possible. We know that radiant heat can be extremely penetrating, extremely harsh to human skin. We're not designed for that. Neither are our Australian homes. We're not designed for radiant heat and high fire, fire um, action. So have that hat, have the natural fiber clothing, have those tough leather gloves and sturdy boots. They will protect you in the event of a fire. But both Julie and I are members, are volunteer members of our local brigades. And the one thing that we dislike the most or find quite annoying when we turn out to grass fires or scrub fires is people dressed in shorts and thongs and a t-shirt trying to put out fires with small hose pipes or totally unprepared, totally inappropriate, and then suffering burns or sort of heat exhaustion, as we've mentioned earlier. Why risk it? Why, if, if you are going to have any chance of survival, survival against uh, nature's uh, rural elements, then covering up has to be the way to go. We spent a bit of time watching the video about radiant heat. Sheltering behind or inside solid objects may provide some form of protection from this invisible force. Yes, uh, the gradient heat travels laterally in straight lines, but it won't travel through solid buildings or around corners. So that's one way of seeking protection, seeking protection, but certainly staying away from any glass windows or glass of any kind, such that it may actually break and cause, cause further damage. 
we speak a lot about seeking refuge in water courses, water courses such as rivers, dams, maybe a swimming pool, any sort of water reservoir that you think will give you a level of protection. We also have um, mixed thoughts, should we say, around stationary cars and seeking refuge in a vehicle. We clearly advocate for not seeking refuge in a stationary vehicle. And I think Julie might explain a bit more as to why the pros and cons of that action. If, if it's necessary to seek um, protection in a stationary vehicle, then you must do that if you are caught in a fire. But if you have a choice, a stationary vehicle, a vehicle is not the place to be. If you are caught on the road um, trying to escape a fire, then you try and pull off to the side of the road in an unburnt or cleared area. Have a look around you as you're driving your car. If you know that you're in danger and, and it's imminent danger, then look around you, see where you are. Pull off to a cleared area or a burnt area. Get down low, get away from the windows. Have a woolen blanket in your car. Put, get down below the windows to avoid that radiant heat. It will be hot, it will be dusty. Leave your lights on so emergency vehicles or anyone else can see you. The one thing you do not want to do is to park on the road and be hit by an emergency vehicle or be an obstacle for an emergency vehicle to get past. Once the fire's gone past and it will happen quickly and it will be hot and dusty, and sickening once it has gone past hop out onto the burnt side of the road just monitor your conditions but the best thing you could do is not be there in the first place mm, absolutely you know um it, it doesn't even bear thinking about does it the the actual intensity of fire in a situation like that and you're trying to seek protection in a motor vehicle it, it's a scary place for sure. But thanks, Julie, for, for those comments. Um, another consideration that we would like to give during this presentation is bushfire neighbourhood safer place. This is a designated place where members of the community can go to seek some form of protection from a fire situation. One thing that we must stress, as is the name suggests, a place of last resort, it clearly is a last resort. It's the really the bottom end of your list of where you could go in the event of a bad fire day. Don't expect any level of guaranteed safety. And certainly it won't be a comfortable experience. I mean, don't expect someone to bring you um, a cup of cocoa in your slippers or anything like that but it offers a chance of some form of survival away from radiant heat. That's one thing that it does do. In the area of Grasmere, your identified bush, player, bush, place fire, bush fire place of last resort, there's actually a total of nine within 13 kilometer radius. Um, two that I'd like to mention is the Warnable Davidson Oval, which is approximately 10 kilometers away and also the Warrnambool Albert Park Football Club, which is about 11 kilometres away. Other bushfire places of last week resort include the Reed Oval, the Walter Oval, and the Merivale Rec Reserve, just to mention a few. But all of these are identified on the CFA NSP, or Neighbourhood Safer Place site, and you can look those up there. But clearly there are nine within the 13 kilometre radius. It's great to know that they're there, but they are a last resort in the event of a bad fire day. Have your fire plan, know where you're gonna go, monitor your own Vic Emergency app, know which direction you're gonna go with, know which roads are open for you to access comfortably and put that plan into place and plan early. We like to show this image of fires as we come towards the end of our presentation this afternoon. And this gives you some idea of the scope and uh, veracity of fires. Not a nice place, a very disorientating environment, a noisy environment, a dark environment. And if you couple that with radiant heat and the intensity of it, it's not gonna be a pleasant place. 
The take home messages. Make sure you have a plan. And, and there's a, a template that we, we're happy to share with you at the end through our resources link that is your leaving early template. Have it available to all family members so you can view it, decide collectively what you're going to do in the event of the fire. And most importantly, what's the trigger for you to leave? Is it gonna be a severe or a high day? What are the triggers? I think connection to your local brigade is crucially important to know about the capacity of the brigade to deal with fire activity. It's also important for them to know about vulnerable members in the community that might require extra assistance. It may be a neighbour that's socially isolated. It might be a farmer that you never see or other community members that are kind of not socially connected with what's going on. We care for our community through our compassion and cohesion. Before we finish on our last slide, I think Julie would just like to launch our final poll. And I really appreciate the feedback that, that you're giving us. So over to you, Julie. Yes, um, the final poll that we are going to launch is simply one question. Um, yes, it, it, sorry, it is one question. Just um, have you a better understanding of bushfire risk in your local local area um, after watching our presentation, after participating in this presentation. It is um, a yes, no, or confirmed what you'd already um, known. If you could just answer that, that just gives us some feedback of um, how well this presentation has been put together and how well we're doing. So if you could just answer that, thank you very much. Excellent. I'll um, end the polling and share the results. So you do have a better understanding of bushfire, um, bushfire and grass fire um, risk in your local area. So thank you very much for that. Thanks, Raj. Thank you, Julie. So the take home message before we finish on our last slide is be prepared, take ownership of the situation, constantly monitor your environment, particularly on those bad fire days, Stay safe and stay informed with the activities of the CFA and how we can collectively improve our community safety on the event of a bad fire day. Both Julie and I would like to thank you for your time. If any of this information or the visuals has any way impacted you emotionally, mentally, there are a couple of numbers here that I can leave with you for you to contact as a support service, but thank you. And I thank you for your time. And both Julie and I would now like to sign off and say thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation and your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and bye for now.